everybody. You know, uh, this morning I'm coming, hopefully for one of the last times, a, uh, coming from an empty auditorium. You know, we've been waiting for uh, this day for a couple of months now, a day that we can come back and, and worship here in our own building. And today that's being scheduled for May 24th. Uh, we'll be meeting at 1030 for our worship service. You know, but uh, as we think about coming back together, we do want to acknowledge that there's some that may not be ready to do that yet. Uh, some of you may fall into a group of uh, you're older than the age of 65, or you have an underlying uh, health condition, or maybe you're just not quite ready to get uh, you and your family back out into a crowd, and that's okay. We want to make sure that you understand uh, that that we understand that, and uh, when you're ready to be back here, then we're gonna be even more excited. Uh, till that day comes, we are planning on having a live stream solution for everybody, so uh, keep an eye out for that, so that you're still gonna be able to participate in what's going on here at the building. So where do we start? Uh, besides this video attached to uh, your Sunday email, is going to be a, a comprehensive document that talks about what returning to on-site worship is going to look like. And I, I really plead with you, I, I beg you, to, uh, to, to look at that document. It's several pages long. We're not going to talk about everything on that this morning. And uh, it'll be comprehensive in that it's going to talk about what you're going to see when you get here. Uh, about uh, how communion's going to work, uh, about the really important stuff that there's going to be no coffee. So for you coffee drinkers, set your alarm 30 minutes earlier and uh, make sure you get your coffee uh, taken care of before you get here. You know, as we think about it, we also want to make sure as you come in and we find some things being different that uh, we really encourage you to come with a servant heart uh, everybody's not going to be in the same place. We had uh, as many people as said, I can't wait to be there. There were those that said, uh, I'm coming, but I'm still a little bit apprehensive. And so uh, everybody's not going to be ready for a, uh, a shake, a handshake, or a hug, which we're going to talk about more later. Uh, some are just thinking, I'm going to be lucky if I get there and I don't have to touch too much stuff. So just think about that as uh, you're interacting with people uh, that morning. A little bit also of encouragement for during the week uh, after we've met, maybe as you're talking to your friends and uh, maybe they haven't decided to come back yet, be encouraging to them uh, in a positive way, but also be careful uh, not to belittle the decision that they've made or to shame or judge them into coming back. Uh, they'll be back when they're ready and uh, we feel uh, real positive about that and want to keep a, a real positive outlook. So let's jump in to see uh, what Sunday morning is going to look like. Uh, that morning before you leave the house, we encourage you to screen for uh, symptoms. Taking your temperature, 97.2 uh, is one of the things that you need to do, but also look out for the other symptoms uh, that uh, they're talking about uh, that this virus can have. Uh, we also, you know, acknowledge that uh, uh, everybody's not going to show symptoms, and so uh, that's why it's even that much more important for those that are here to follow the guidelines that we've set out. So when you arrive, uh, the first thing we want you to think about is practice your social distancing and uh, stay six foot uh, apart from people, you know, as soon as you get out of the car and start walking in. Uh, that morning, we will, uh, we're going to make it as uh, much no touch as possible. There's greeters that will be holding the doors open. The auditorium doors will be open. And as I alluded to a little bit earlier, to a lot of our angst, we're going to ask that there be uh, no hugging, no handshakes, no shoulder bumps, and just a real uh, no contact morning because uh, there's just no, we won't know what the other person may be expecting and we want to be respectful of that. 
so once you find, come into the auditorium, you're going to find uh, some ushers, and they're going to help you find some seating. And because that's going to look something different than it does the last time you were here. And so here's a little photo or video that shows you what it's going to look like on that Sunday morning. Hey, look everybody, I got a seat down front. So once you get here, find a place that uh, you're comfortable with, but also be willing to stretch yourself a little bit for the location that you're going to be in. Then the good part comes. We'll be here to lift up our voices, to sing together songs of praise to our God. We'll share in the Lord's Supper together as we celebrate the boundless love of our great God. And we will pray together and proclaim his word and, uh, and the message of hope that we receive every day. You know, as, uh, as your shepherds, we always want to uh, be speaking positively and compassionately and in an understanding way. And so we ask uh, that from you today and uh, also ask that uh, uh, you'll be convicted to, uh, to accommodate the things that we're asking you to do and that really uh, that our state is asking us to do. Uh, as we talked about earlier, we want to really encourage everybody to have a servant heart. And uh, so I'd like to close with this scripture and uh, share that with you this morning. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by, make, by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, and focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. We're expecting a great day when we come back, and we're really excited about it. We hope to see you here, and uh, we, just, we love you guys and hope uh, that that Sunday morning is just a great worship experience. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, then uh, I'll be right back in a few minutes with just a couple of announcements. Otherwise... Have a great week. decided to come back to the house for uh, what I hope will be the last filming of their welcome time from a home and uh, so uh, as we said earlier uh, next Sunday uh, May 24th we'll be at the building for worship uh, if you've been involved in our online uh, Bible classes be sure and check in with Phil or Tom and uh, find out uh, what time those classes are going to be meeting so let's jump into our encouragement time and our, our prayer thoughts. I uh, want to remember uh, Ann T was hospitalized this week and uh, had a procedure to deal with some internal bleeding that she had. Her condition has improved and she uh, will be going home this weekend. 
Also, Glenn G. is at home recovering from a pancreatitis attack. And Patricia had her surgery this week. Everything went well, and she's at home recovering. Uh, Patty L.'s mom is in rehab after a fall and breaking her leg. And then Mary Jo and I would like to uh, ask you to keep uh, Becca and Brittany in, our, in your prayers. Uh, they're due to have their babies in the next couple of weeks, and we're getting excited. We want to make sure they stay virus-free, them and their family, so we'd appreciate your prayers for them. So that's all I have for the uh, prayer time this morning. I would like to uh, just close out uh, this time with a reading from the 63rd Psalms. You, God, are my God, and earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. We serve a great God. I hope you have a great day of worship and praise. See ya. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my voice. I lift up my voice to the Lord. Singing I love you, Lord. Singing I love you, Lord. Singing I love you, Lord. I love you. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. I love you. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I
Hey, good morning, everyone. We're sitting here in my living room where I have watched many a uh, movie with my family and got my trusty remote control right here. What we're doing today is introducing our sermon with a short video clip from a movie called Wonder. It's about a 10-year-old boy named August Pullman who has a rare genetic disorder that causes all kinds of facial uh, deformities and growing up. Through the first 10 years of his life, he's had 27 surgeries. That's about three surgeries a year. And as he's going through this process, he's being homeschooled by his parents. And as he reaches fifth grade, he's 10 years old, his parents decide it's time for Augie, as they call him, to try school. Now, going to school from homeschooling to regular schooling is a difficult transition for anybody. But as you can imagine, for this little boy who actually goes around wearing an astronaut helmet to hide his face, you can imagine how difficult this must have been. So what we're going to do in this clip is we're going to see as Augie goes into the school, has a very rough beginning, but eventually makes a friend named Jack. And he invites his friend Jack to come home. And so in this opening scene, we're going to see... Augie asking his mom if it's okay if he brings his new friend home with him. And we'll see in this clip some of the resiliency, wit, and humor of this 10-year little boy as he copes with life with this very difficult circumstance that has been thrust upon him. Here we go. Where's the popcorn? I'm going as Boba Fett this year. I like Halloween, but Christmas is still the best holiday. No way, Halloween is the best. Pillowcase of candy versus two weeks off school. You're nuts. <laughs> you see? Even your dog agrees. Hey, Mom, is it okay if Jack comes over? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mrs. B. When you get snow on Christmas. But you can get snow on Halloween. If there's wow. like, if you live in Alaska or there's a blizzard. I've got to be cool. Have you ever thought about having plastic surgery? No, I've never thought about it. Why? <laughs> Dude, this is after plastic surgery. It takes a lot of work to look this good. Nate. Fire. So here is this smart, lovable kid who doesn't look like anyone else. He looks different from everybody else. And so he is excluded at school and he's ridiculed and he's made fun of and he's picked on. And so after having a really hard day at school in this next scene, we're going to see Augie taking it out on his family. And so he runs upstairs to his bedroom, puts on his astronaut helmet. He just wants to be alone, but his mom's going to follow him upstairs to the room to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her 10-year-old little boy. Let's take a look. That is not the way we leave the table. Hey, come on. Talk to me. Sit down. Take that off, please. I'm sorry. It's okay. It'll be okay. Why do I have to be so ugly? You are not ugly, Augie. You just have to say that because you're my mom. Oh, 
Because I'm your mom, it doesn't count? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm your mom, it counts the most. Because I know you the most. You are not ugly, and anyone who cares to know you will see that. They won't even talk to me. It matters what I look different. I try to pretend that it doesn't, but it does. I know. Is it always going to matter? I don't know. Oh, honey. Listen. Look at me. We all have marks on our face. I have this wrinkle here from your first surgery, and I have these wrinkles here from your last surgery. This is the map that shows us where we're going. And this is the map that shows us where we've been. And it's never, ever ugly. What about your gray hair? That's compliments of your dad, I think. And as though we summoned him. How was your day? My day is really good right now. Can you identify it all? with this little boy, with his mom and his dad. I know you can. Our world hurls all kinds of mean names and labels at us that can stick with us for all of our life. Words like ugly, fat, skinny, loser, Unpopular, nerd, underachiever, has been, second rate, idiot, moron, lots of really mean words and names. Most of the words that we probably hear today, I can't even say, right? I won't say in this message to you, but you know those words, you've heard those words, and unfortunately, you maybe you've even said some of those words. We are living in a pandemic around the world, around the world, in every language and every culture, there are mean rotten, vile names, words, and labels that we give to one another to, heart, to hurt each other, to harm one another, to belittle and shame one another. Why we do it, I don't really know other than to say these words have been spoken to us and we just pass them along even though we know how much they hurt and how much they sting. Now, our God gives us the cure. He gives us the answer for this pandemic of name calling and hurting and shaming that is in our world. What I want to do is to remind you of the gospel of Jesus and what God has done for us. And I want to remind you of Satan's role in this. Satan is the source of the pandemic of accusation and name calling. I want to remind you one more time of the scene in Revelation chapter 12, where Satan is described in this vision that John has as the great red dragon, and he's making war in heaven itself. Hear the word of God in Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. Here's what the Word of God says. Then war broke out in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough. They lost their place in heaven. The great red dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters. who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Satan misleads the whole world. How? By accusing us. By giving us a name that we don't need to hear. But we allow it to shape us so that we see it as our identity. And we think of the accusations, thief, drunkard, liar, adulterer, pervert, dirty-minded, gossip, backstabber, coward, lazy, selfish, troublemaker, hypocrite, sinner, Guilty, vile, unworthy. And our God responds to all of this by coming into our midst and standing with us. Jesus comes to us in the events of the cross and the word of God that was prophesied long ago is fulfilled of Isaiah 53, that he was numbered with the transgressors. He came and stood with us. He was that kid in the lunchroom at school that sees another kid that's being left by himself and nobody will sit with that kid, but Jesus comes and sits with that kid and puts his arm around that kid and welcomes him and accepts him and says, you're my friend. And we see Jesus in the story of the gospel as he's living his life. He's doing this and he's coming alongside of and he's welcoming people that everybody else has rejected. And everybody else is kicked to the curb. Jesus, I remind you, was called a friend of sinners. A friend of the tax collectors and the sinners. He was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. Why? Because of the company that he kept. Jesus came for us. And so our world will speak the words of Satan, accuse us and label us based on our mistakes and our shortcomings and our failures. But God comes to us in the person of Jesus, accepts us, welcomes us, and calls us friend. Our God gives us names like, you're my people, beloved, forgiven, chosen ones, my sons and my daughters whom I love. This is how our God sees us. Our God who knows us the most gives us the names that we need to hear the most and let those names and those words be our identity. I want to remind you of the gospel as Peter speaks it in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, 
the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you see what God is doing in the gospel? Jesus came and stood with the rejected, the pathetic, the sinners, the ostracized, the condemned, those that are unworthy in the eyes of the world, the nobodies. And Jesus came to identify with us. And he was rejected. Think of the events of the cross, how Jesus was accused of being a liar. He claimed to be the son of God. He claimed to be a king. He's a blasphemer. He was beaten. He was ridiculed. And even after they nailed him to the cross, they continued to throw names and insults at Jesus. He knows what it's like to be hated and to be ostracized and to be ridiculed. He knows what it is to be called by all kinds of names, by people who matter. Even his closest friends abandon him. They didn't want to be a part of it. They didn't want the collateral damage that would come from being in association with him. And so even Peter, one of his closest friends, three times denied that he even knew Jesus. Are you his friend? No, I don't know this guy. I'm not one of his, I'm not one of his followers. And that on top of everything else that's happening at the cross explains no doubt why Jesus on the night that he's betrayed and on, on the cusp of all these things happening says, to his friends, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus knows what it's like to feel these emotions. They rejected Jesus. They nailed him to the cross. They, they spoke all kinds of names against Jesus. But on the third day, at the empty tomb, through the resurrection, God says, this is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. They rejected him, God elevated him, and gave him a name, a name that is above all other names. The God, the Father who knows him the most, what he says about Jesus matters the most. And our God knows you the most. He knows you better than anyone else. He knows everything that you've done. He knows every mistake. He knows every thought that you've had, good or bad. He knows every shortcoming. He knows every sin that you've committed in your life. And he knows who you are, your potential. And he loves you. We have a tendency to let Satan tell us that we're unworthy. And I hear even Christians in our language sometimes who say, even though we are unworthy, and I understand the move. Paul will call himself the worst of sinners, but yet Paul also sees his identity as called, chosen, and loved of God. I'm apostle of Christ by the grace of God. This is who I am. Our God knows 
your mistakes, but you are his. He loves you. And we need to hear the word of God in John 3, 16 in this way, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. In God's eyes, in God's estimation, you are worthy. You're worth this to him. And so instead of pushing back against the gospel that says these words that we just heard, that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. God has given us these new names, these new identities. The old is gone. The new has come in Christ. We are a new creation. And we have a tendency when we have these words spoken over to us to say, that's not who I am. This is who you are. Don't reject God the Father's names and words that he speaks over us. He says of you, you're my son, you're my daughter, you're my bride. I love you. You are precious to me. You're important to me. You have great potential. You have a great future ahead of you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I've given you my spirit. You are able to do so much more than you think or imagine. Don't listen to the world. Don't listen to those people who are just spewing the words of Satan himself and telling you these mean things and trying to give you a label and a name that doesn't belong on my children. So as you think about this week and you think about your life and the pandemic that we're living in of these mean words and names that we speak over each other, I simply want to challenge you in this day and in this week to be the voice of God, to stop being the voice of Satan and choose to be the voice of of God. Speak words of life and hope and healing. Stop saying mean words to people. Stop passing them on. And instead, be like this mom who goes to her 10-year-old little boy who's hurting and who has acted out in his pain. And instead of going and heaping on more accusations, she simply points to the behavior and says, that's not appropriate behavior. Let's talk. What's going on? Satan is speaking these vile, vicious, poisonous words all in our world. You and I have the cure. And it's the love of God. It's the gospel of Jesus. People matter. People are important. People are precious. People are to be loved, not used, loved. And so let's get out there today and every day and let's love people with the love of God. Let's let them know that they are precious, that they're important, that they're beautiful and wonderful, full of all kinds of incredible potential because of the redeeming power of God at work in our lives and in our world. Love with the love of God and give the cure to everyone. Don't hide it. Don't mask it. Don't hide behind fear that somebody will ridicule us when we dare to stand with those who are being hurt and put our arms around them and love them the way that God has loved us. Jesus came into this world, put his arm around you and me, welcomed us and accepted us. And we are to love and accept one another in the same way that our God has loved and accepted us. God bless you in this this week and may the Lord be at work in all of his people all around the world to bring about the cure that our world desperately needs.
communion message, uh, communion scripture this morning is from John chapter 11, and it's the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, we're just going to look at a small part of that story, sort of the middle part of it, beginning in verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God who is to come into the world. Lazarus is dead and in the tomb. His family is grieving. Martha hears that Jesus is coming. They've sent for Jesus and he hasn't come. They waited and Lazarus died. And now he comes after he's dead. And Martha goes out and her first statements are are almost accusatory. Um, But Jesus reminds her who he is. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks her this most important question. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe. I think when we come to communion every week, we face the same question. What do you believe? And when we partake of communion, when we share it together as a family, we are answering the question in the same way. We are proclaiming our belief in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, who was to come into the world, the resurrected and returning Savior. We proclaim that we believe. Let's pray. Father, we proclaim this morning 
that we believe. We believe in Jesus as the Messiah, as your son, the one who was promised, the one who came and lived and died and was raised again on the third day, the one whose tomb is empty and the one who is returning. We proclaim our belief as we share this memorial celebration of the bread and the cup. Bless us as we take these emblems, as we celebrate this time. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you as you celebrate communion, as you again proclaim your belief in Jesus as the risen and returning Savior. In his presence there is comfort. In his presence there is peace. When we seek the Father's heart, we will find such blessed assurance in the presence of the Lord. In his presence there is comfort. In his We are standing. 